Susan Spica, executive director of a group called Education Voters of Pennsylvania. What's the group about and what are you trying to achieve? Yep, so Education Voters of Pennsylvania was founded in 2008 to support a pro-public education agenda uh, in the Commonwealth. And so we work to help inform voters and, and um, regular people about what's happening in Harrisburg and at the local level that that impacts public education. And we work to get people engaged and activated in supporting policies that will make our public schools in every community as strong and as good for all of our kids as possible. And what would you say is your group's uh, philosophy on, on how you do things, a thread that runs through everything you do? We believe that every child has uh, is entitled and deserves a high quality public education in a neighborhood school that can meet their needs. And so everything that we do is focused around ensuring that all kids, like no matter where they come from, no matter what they look like, no matter what their zip code, will have access to the educational opportunities they need to be successful after they graduate. Now tell us about your <clears throat> methods. Uh, how do you go about trying to bring about change? Yep, so we, um, we work a lot with community organizations and regular people and we talk to them, we do training sessions online, and we do a lot of information sharing with a, a very large list of people that we have around the state. We also work in coalitions with a lot of other organizations. Um, part of one of our big coalitions is the Pennsylvania Schools Work Campaign. And so we have organizations that span like from one end of the state to the other, and we bring together all of our voices so that we can speak with one voice uh, to lawmakers. We have rallies, we, have, we help people you know, figure out how to talk to their lawmakers and meet with them and call them so that individuals who have an interest in this uh, subject can actually have their voices heard by the people who have the power to make the decisions. And how do you go about uh, working with lawmakers? Uh, just how does that task work out on a daily basis? Visits to the Capitol, I imagine? So, yep, we, we visit the Capitol. Um, we for example, if we release a report, we will make sure that we deliver a copy of that report to every single lawmaker's office. Mm -hmm. um, we will offer to have a, um, an information session to help them kind of like understand issues. And um, then of course we just have like individual visits with certain lawmakers about issues that are important uh, to them. Mm -hmm. Now, a minute ago, Susan, you said you worked with regular people, so that makes me think about parents. And of course, they insist on having a voice uh, about their kids. And, and how do you go about connecting with them? And I imagine they have some things to say. Parents have a lot to say because parents understand exactly what's happening in their kids' schools, and so they really are the experts on what needs to happen in Harrisburg in order for their kids to get what they need. So we have community meetings, um, we have a lot of Zoom info sessions where we can bring people together so that if you can't, you know, if you live in a far-flung area of Pennsylvania, you can still like join us and be and be part of this work. Um, so you know, we just we have like a a really large community of people. Um, and then we also have advocates that we have trained who can go out into communities and then they can meet with their communities at the local level. Um, so we, we have a huge network. Mm -hmm. Well, back to the parents just for a moment. What concerns them most about their kids' education? Maybe you're working on issue A for a while and then the parents remind you about issue B. What are the issues that recur with parents? In general, the issue is like the lack of resources to meet their children's needs in the building. Mm -hmm. So those resources res including um, teachers, um, extra help, after school programming, um, you know, like just what it is that their kid needs to be able to have a successful academic experience in, in the school building. Mm -hmm. Now let's get some perspective on education funding here in Pennsylvania. Where does Pennsylvania fit in nationwide with respect to funding our schools? So um, our legislature unfortunately has been very cheap when it comes to funding public education. So we rank 42nd to 45th in the nation in the state share of funding for public schools. So Pennsylvania provides roughly 38% of what it costs to educate our K-12 students in public schools. The national average is a lot closer to 50%. So the problem we have in Pennsylvania is that when the state provides such a low share, we have very heavy reliance on property taxes to fund schools. Mm -hmm. and that that means there are some school districts that are in communities that have very large property tax bases. So with a very small tax increase, they can raise a lot of revenue. Now, maybe you've already answered my next question, mm -hmm. which is about lawmakers. You said yep. that they were cheap about education, but you just mentioned 
property taxes. Right. So perhaps lawmakers are just expecting to put a big reliance on property taxes, and the state doesn't have to put so much money in. Right. And so that's what they have been plan. That's what they've been doing for a very long time. They have said, like, we're going to just give you what we feel like giving you public schools. Hmm. You will take it, and you will figure it out at the at the local level. And then we've got in Pennsylvania some of the greatest disparities between wealthy areas and, and areas that are poor because of this reliance on property taxes. So while some school districts can raise taxes a little and raise a lot of revenue, others you know, raise taxes over and over and over again. And some of the, the c communities with the highest uh, tax effort are actually some of the poorest communities in the state because no matter how high they raise their taxes, there just is no property tax base to draw revenue from. Mm -hmm. So. Um, it's very lopsided and it's very broken. And we know low-income districts need money more than other districts, yep. but before we identify any of those uh, specific districts, how about uh, how much is extra? How much extra funding is needed in general to take care of Pennsylvania students statewide without breaking it down geographically? Right. So. Um, Pennsylvania's school funding system was declared unconstitutional in 2023. The judge ordered the governor, the legislature, and the, the plaintiffs in the case to get together and to come up with a system that would work. So lawmakers formed the Basic Education Funding Commission, and they spent months on the road listening, did very, very good, very, very hard work, and they came up with a plan where they identified how much each school district needed to be able to provide students with the resources that mm -hmm. a school district that is successful has. Mm -hmm. And they said, how much is each school district spending and how much do they, we need to fill the gap? And they found that we have a $5.1 billion gap that needs to be mm -hmm. filled in order for all of our schools to have the resources that will help students be successful. So about how many school districts have serious need for more funding? Is it possible to put a number on them? We have hundreds of districts, of course. Yep, um, I think it is 428 school districts have a gap, have an adequacy gap. Now, some of those adequacy gaps are small, and some of those ad adequacy gaps are really big. So that, that ranges, but um, 428 districts. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's just ask a basic question about that. Why aren't the low-income school distri districts getting the money they need? Now, you said that the commission has made some progress on that. But why the history of uh, not getting adequate funding in the first place? Right. So, you know, the legislature has never looked at, like, what a district needs for its unique students hmm. who are attending the buildings. For years, Pennsylvania said we didn't really we didn't have a funding formula we were one of three states that didn't have a funding formula and the legislature would say hmm, we feel like giving school public schools two percent increase this year everybody gets two percent doesn't matter if you lost students gained students have financial need don't have financial need they just kind of had this like everybody gets this, this the same and then when you do that for long enough and you are so dependent on property taxes you end up with what we have today which is just this haves and have nots and and the need for the state to come in and fill the gaps for the have-nots. Mm -hmm. So let's consider, Susan, geographically where the school districts are that are in the greatest need. They are spread across the entire state. There is, it is a statewide let's problem. Let's start with our big cities. How about Philadelphia? Yep. So like, if you look at the big cities, like all the big cities have these problems. So Philadelphia, Reading, Erie, Allentown, Scranton. Mm -hmm. um, but then when we look at a map of the school districts, we can see that in rural areas, they are facing the exact same problems because they have the exact same issues as the larger urban areas. You know, dwindling property tax base, many students who have very high needs, um, inadequate state funding over the years. Mm -hmm. And so um, really it is, it is really truly a, a statewide problem. Now, a few years ago, a new funding formula was devised by state government. And just how much has that helped? It has helped a lot. So all of the money, all of the new money that has gone to school districts mm -hmm. since 2015 has gone through this basic education. And that's key, that it's new money. It's new money. So everything prior to 2015 got locked in. And, and we said everybody's going to get held harmless, so mm -hmm. nobody's going to lose money. Mm -hmm. because when Meaning you, you're going to get the same amount you got last year. Same amount you got last year. So everybody gets the same amount they got in 2015. Mm -hmm. And then going forward after that, we have, I don't know, well over a billion dollars that goes through mm -hmm. a formula that is based on the actual number of students in a mm -hmm. district and the needs of the students. And so those dollars are very much directed mm -hmm. to the school districts that have the right. greatest need. But when you have a $5.1 billion gap and you have, you know, a billion plus going mm -hmm. through the formula, it, it is not 
it is not enough, right? The pie is too small. So only a fraction of the total funding goes through the new formula, right? Correct, correct, yep. Mm -hmm. Why not put all the money through a, a new formula? Um, because the pie is too small, so what you would do is you would just reallocate the the pain that in the, the inadequacies from one set of school districts to another set of school districts. Mm -hmm. So what you would end up doing is just taking a whole lot of money from one group of poor students and giving it to a different mm -hmm. group of poor students. So um, instead of like pitting school districts and kids against each other, what we call the school funding hunger games, huh. we are saying we need a bigger pie and we need to make sure that everybody has it off. Let's go back to the court ruling that you mentioned uh, a few minutes ago. And uh, that ruling was saying really in simple language that the PA school funding method we have is unconstitutional. But yet uh, it, it seems like we need someone to elaborate more on that. Uh, when the word constitutional was unconstitutional was put out there by the court, what did they mean? Did they give us any kind of specific recourse or recommendations? Right. That seemed to be a line in the sand when that court ruling came out. Yeah, it is. Um, we are in a moment right now where I think we have seen a possibility for a fix thanks to that court ruling. And the judge said um, both the the current system violates the Equal Protection Clause because students, just simply because they're in a, a poor zip code, have wildly different educational opportunities than students in a wealthy zip mm -hmm. code. And um, it's not a system that is, quote, thorough and efficient, which is in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. So um, the judge said all students need to have a, um, I can't remember exact, the exact words she had, but like a, like a comprehensive, effective education like all mm -hmm. students deserve to have the same level of effective education. And so that was a little squishy, right? And mm -hmm. so during the trial, the, the attorneys put forward um, the student achievement data and said what we need to make sure is that all students have the resources they need so that all students have a chance to be able to achieve on our state tests, which mm -hmm. are the standard that the state set for our public schools. So they looked at PSSA scores and Keystone scores and said, we want all kids to have enough money so that mm -hmm. they have the teachers and the aides and the supports they need so that they have a chance to pass these tests. And so that's the standard that's being used. What brought school funding to a boil in our, our courts? Why did this come up when it did? It had gotten so bad that there were school districts where students clearly by virtue of the fact that there was not enough money in their communities at the local level. So the level, local districts took it to court? The local districts took it to court, absolutely. And the Pennsylvania Association of Rural and Small Schools and the uh, Pennsylvania NAACP chapter, they, they joined in as plaintiffs. Now, what about <clears throat> state lawmakers? How have they reacted to this court ruling? And are they showing any indication to you that they're going to address this ruling? Yes. So um, just a week ago, uh, House Democrats put forward a plan that would actually implement the $5.1 billion increase that was recommended by the Basic Education Funding Commission over seven years. Mm -hmm. And so there is legislation in Harrisburg right now that would, that would provide um, a remedy. Now, what about Governor Shapiro? Uh, what has he been proposing recently that would help, again, the districts that need the most help? Yep. So he took the Basic Education Funding Commission plan, which is the court remedy, mm -hmm. and he put the first year of that plan into his budget. And so he said, I am 100 percent behind making sure that we take this first mm -hmm. step toward uh, constitutional school funding. Now, you said something about $5 billion a moment ago. That was yep. the, the total that recommended by the commission. But for this budget cycle, it's a fraction of that, right? It's just part of that. Right. One seventh. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. And uh, as far as uh, scholarships, that, that's something else that the governor has been getting into. And I, I think he called that the PASS program. Can you enlighten us on any of the programs or any of these acronyms that tend to pop up from state government that yes. are important to education? Yes. So um, there's a contingent of lawmakers in Harrisburg who want school vouchers, and they understand that school vouchers are pretty unpopular. So they come up with all these different names for them. So they have PASS scholarships, Lifeline scholarships. Mm -hmm. So the most recent one, I believe, is the past scholarship system um, that would give tax dollars. They would take tax dollars and put them in an account and right. give a cash handout to families that families could then use to pay for their kids' private education. Mm -hmm. um, this that could be a private school, that could be a religious school. I just want to make that clear. Absolutely, 100%. Whatever school they choose. Um, and 
funding school vouchers and funding private education does not get us one dollar closer to constitutional school funding. In fact, it takes us farther away from being able to have a constitutionally compliant system because it makes it takes money away from being able to fund hmm. public schools and puts it into private Meaning schools. Meaning public traditional schools. Right, yes. And um, we also have a $470 million voucher program already that mm -hmm. many people don't even know about. And um, Yeah, why don't you tell us about that? There's at least two programs. One's the EITC. Is that yep. what you had in mind? Yep. What is that about? So there's the... Uh, there, their partner programs, educational improvement tax credit, opportunity mm -hmm. scholarship tax credit programs, basically they give um, a business can get a tax credit mm -hmm. and then by donating, by basically diverting their money that they would pay in taxes into a quote scholarship organization for a school, okay. they get a tax credit. Then the, the scholarship organization decides what schools it wants to give money to, and then the schools give students financial aid. So it hmm. provides $470 million in financial aid to students in private schools already. Mm -hmm. And I, our organization um, looked into a list of the schools. Uh, there are about 800 schools that are listed as part of the Opportunity Scholarship Tax Credit Program. We looked at roughly every fourth school, and we found that every single school has on the books discriminatory policies that would allow them to exclude students. Students. So LGBTQ plus students, some schools just say not welcome. Um, hmm. Some we found these like pretty. So even as school vouchers goes through, it sounds like you're yeah. saying there's some uh, language that could be an obstacle. Well, I, I'm just saying any dollar that goes into school vouchers is going into a school that will discriminate against students, hmm. period. Like they, they, every single school, like I think the nature of a private school is that the school chooses the students that it will enroll. Hmm. So. You know, it can it can pick you based on your religion. It can pick you based on your academic ability. Um, whatever it wants, that school chooses you. So there is no there is no possible way to have a voucher program that is not going to support discrimination against students. Susan, you told us about the EITC program. Now I want to serve up one more helping of the government alphabet soup here. And let's consider OSTC. That's another form of vouchers. It is another. Tell us. Yep. So OSTC scholar, uh, vouchers are available only to students who live in school districts that are considered low performing. Mm -hmm. So those, it's a, it's a much smaller pot of money that is available for those uh, than the EITC scholarships. And students can receive both EITC and OSTC scholarships. So um, same. So uh, let's consider uh, cyber charter schools mm -hmm. and uh, review us, or, or rather tell us what they are, just one yep. more time, and then tell us what your group's position is. So cyber charter schools educate students at home on a computer, and we they've been around you know for 20 years in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. They are a very good option for some students. However, not all students are really equipped and you know made are going to be successful in cyber charter schools. So they have a definite place in, in our education system. They educate now about 57,000 students, and we have 13 cyber charter schools all around the hmm. state. Um, the, the biggest problem we have with cyber charter schools is the way that Harrisburg funds them. So the state government um, tells mandates, they have a formula in law, and they tell school districts how much money they have to pay in tuition for each school student who goes to a cyber charter school. Mm -hmm. That is based on what the school district spends, and there's a regular education and a special education tuition rate. And so what we've found is that this rate is the same as the rate for brick and mortar schools. We're like the only state in the nation that pays cyber charter schools the same as we mm. pay brick and mortar schools. So over the years, as the incre as we've seen school funding increase for school districts and we've seen like special education costs increase, we have seen cyber charter tuition rates just explode. And with um, with the tuition that they're getting, they, they really can't spend it on students, right? So we are just seeing that cyber charter schools are awash in all of this excess funding that they are wasting on, you know, we did a report, they spent $21 million on advertising last year. One cyber charter school sent a million dollars in gift cards to their students. They spent a million tax dollars. And you have to keep in mind, the most of these tax dollars are coming from property taxes raised at the local level. Mm -hmm. The state provides zero dollars in any kind of reimbursement for cyber charter school tuition bills. So when a school district has to pay, say, $17,000 for every reg regular education student who goes to a cyber charter school and $28,000 for every special education student who goes to a cyber charter school, that adds up. And 
all of those dollars are coming out of the local budget. Most of that money is property taxes. So a lot of our property taxes that we're paying are getting sent to cyber charter schools where they're getting wasted on mm -hmm. advertising or we, we just did a report and we found a single cyber charter school has 35 buildings. Like these are schools that educate kids at home on a computer, but this, mm -hmm. this cyber charter school is like building a real estate empire with property taxes. And I can tell you in my school district, we don't have the money to upkeep and maintain our own buildings. Like we have to save up year after year to try to put a new roof on a building or to replace a boiler. Um, and so they're taking our our, our tax dollars and building these buildings. It is, it is bonkers. And, um, Sounds there is, like a good investigation for a lawmaker. It is. And, and there's, Governor Shapiro has proposed um, a flat rate for regular education students for cyber charter tuition of $8,000. The House passed with bipartisan support the same idea where we would have like flat rate, like a rate that is based on like the cost of educating kids at home on a computer. So now our, our barrier is the Pennsylvania hmm. Senate. So we need our Senate Republicans in Pennsylvania to come along with the idea that we should be paying cyber charter schools what it actually hmm. costs them to educate students. And then we'll have like so much less pressure on property taxes, you know, on raising them. And then we'll have a lot more, um, opportunities for kids in, in our school districts because we won't be wasting this money on cyber charter tuition. Now, I'm intrigued by what you said about the million dollars in gift cards that were given to students. And, and my main point being that a government entity obviously feels compelled to spend money that it's allocated. Right. And so, yeah, I mean... It, it had to go somewhere, and they decided to spend it on gift cards? On, on gift cards for students. So there was a million dollar, $1.1 million in grocery gift cards for mm -hmm. students, and then $100,000 on Target gift cards for students. And there was a different cyber charter school that gave kids attendance gift cards. And I, I used to be a high school teacher. Oh. And if I had been able to say to my students, at the end of the month, if you are here every day, I will give you a $15 gift card to Domino's or to Barnes & Nobles, those kids would have been in that classroom every single day. They would have loved that, right? Like. Mm -hmm. But is that how a school should be taking our property taxes and, and spending them for, like, it just doesn't make sense, right? For student rewards is what for it amounts student, to. Yeah, they're doing student rewards. And yes, that's nice, but wouldn't it be nice if everybody had that money? Mm -hmm. So. So what kind of changes uh, should be made funding uh, overall for cyber charter schools? And right away I'm thinking about the new funding formula, I'm relatively new, came up with a few years ago. Uh, is that, uh, is charter school funding subject to that new formula? Um, nope. That's not, it's a separate system. And so mm -hmm. what we need to do is just have a rational system. Where, and mm -hmm. I think that Governor Shapiro's proposal to say for a regular education student would get $8,000, that is like pretty much like what we see across the nation. Like that is plenty of money in other states. There's no reason that that shouldn't be plenty of money for students in Pennsylvania. And um, he doesn't touch the special education um, allocation that they would get. So let's just say cyber charter schools get a lot of special education funding from school districts that they don't spend on special education services. They reallocate our special education dollars to other things. So the $8,000 flat rate for regular education students would save $262 million. Out of the billion dollars that cyber charters get every year, they would be just fine. They would have no problem continuing to educate students if we had this rational system. What else is on the radar of your group at this point? So we just, we, our, our three things are constitutional funding, closing the $5.1 billion right. gap, keeping vouchers out of Pennsylvania, because mm -hmm. once those vouchers come in, when you start giving cash handouts to families, once a small group of families get a cash handout, every family that already has a kid who's in a private school is going to say, I want that $10,000 check. And we have seen that happen in states mm -hmm. all over the nation. Oh, is that so? Tell us more about what we can learn about the history of vouchers from states who already have them. Right. So we should just look at Arizona, where they started out by having a very small, limited voucher program. And every year, the, the legislature in, in, increased the students who are eligible for the vouchers. Mm -hmm. And so finally, they are now at a universal voucher program. And what they've found is like probably 70% of the vouchers go to families whose kids never have been in a public school. Mm -hmm. It has just become a subsidy for well-off families who are already sending their kids to private schools. But what it does is it means there's not enough money left over to be able to actually fund the public schools the way they need to be funded, right? Like mm -hmm. there is one pot of money that we can spend on education. And we have a constitution that says that we have to provide a thorough and efficient system of public education in Pennsylvania. So there is no room in Pennsylvania for any additional funding for vouchers until we mm -hmm. get this 
constitutional public school funding mm -hmm. system in place. Now, if you recall, Susan, last year, uh, vouchers came up at the last minute. It just seemed days before the budget was due. It, it came up as an issue, and then that fire died out. But here we are talking about it two months before the budget, so it seems to have been uh, revitalized as an important subject uh, at the Capitol. So how does your group respond to that renewed interest from lawmakers? Does that mean more visits to the Capitol, targeted visits? It means a lot more talking to um, lawmakers and to Governor Shapiro about what these vouchers actually, actually fund. So mm -hmm. Governor Shapiro likes to say it's ridiculous in Pennsylvania that two women can get married on a Sunday and then get fired on Monday because of discrimination, right? Like that can happen in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. What he doesn't go on to say is their children could get kicked out of their private school on Tuesday. And so we are working really hard to message to Governor Shapiro that if he wants to support vouchers, he will be supporting explicit discrimination against students and LGBTQ plus students. And, and I just don't understand how that comports with the values that he talks about. So we are both trying to like help Governor Shapiro um, situate himself better in this conversation to support public schools that educate all students so that he won't want to support them. And then we're also working um, with lawmakers to help them understand like what these vouchers actually support. Now, what do you hope to accomplish uh, during this budget cycle? So we are working to get parents and community members in every corner of the Commonwealth talking to their lawmakers about supporting Governor Shapiro's plan for public education, uh, which includes the cyber charter regular tuition rate, and then also telling them not there is no trade for vouchers. Like this is not vouchers are off the table, like vouchers are done, like don't even look at the vouchers, like let's focus on our public system. Uh, last question, how would you rank uh, Governor Shapiro's performance overall to that of his predecessor, who happened to be a Democrat too? Um, I will say Governor Tom Wolf, in his heart, cared about public education more than I think any elected official has in, in the Commonwealth, so he is a hard person to follow. Um, if Governor Shapiro could just get this little fascination with vouchers kind of like out of his realm and like put that to the side, I, I think there is like incredible potential for him to be the governor who actually fixes this unconstitutional school funding system. So I am hoping that this is, that is the direction that he'll go in. Susan Spicka, Executive Director of Education Voters of Pennsylvania, thank you for your time. Thank you.